Well, good morning again. My name is Ricky Hemi. It's great to be with you guys today. Can we give it up for Farrington again with that baptism? How awesome was that? That was so exciting. And thank you, Joe, for leading us through that. Uh, Today I have the privilege of kicking off a really important season in the church's calendar because today is called Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday, if you don't know, is the day Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem and appeared to be welcomed as the true King of Israel. It was quite the scene. The people there were so ecstatic that they laid their cloaks and palm branches on the road and they tried to create a kind of red carpet welcome for Jesus. And on the surface, the crowds on Palm Sunday appeared to be crowning Jesus as king. But as we'll soon find out, it was a false coronation. Because the exciting cries for salvation, Hosanna, which means save us now, were later transformed into shouts for execution. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, the crowd said on Friday. You see, Palm Sunday is an important event because it marks the beginning of Jesus' final week on earth, a week also known as Passion Week. Passion Week traces Jesus' step-by-step journey to the cross, It details the ups and downs that he faced along the way. And it's so important to the gospel writers that a disproportionate amount of space is given to that single week. The book of Luke dedicates a fifth of that gospel to Passion Week. Matthew dedicates a fourth, Mark one-third, John one-half. And taken together, all the gospels combined, one-third of the gospel's material is dedicated to the events between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. And that's because it's the most important week of the most important life ever lived. Well, in today's sermon, we're going to evaluate three separate scenes from Passion Week. And each scene is represented by a symbolic tree. Scene one is Palm Sunday. Scene two is the fig tree, which happened on Monday. And scene three is the cross, which happened on Friday. And with each scene, we need to ask a question. The question is this, was it fruitful? The reason we're asking this question is because Passion Week serves as a warning about the danger of fruitlessness, the danger of profession without practice. So please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to look at scene one, Palm Sunday. And as you turn there, I'm going to open up our time in a word of prayer. Will you you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you so much for the baptisms that we uh, got to witness today, one at nine, one at 1045, people proclaiming that they love you. And I pray, God, that their lives would be fruitful, that they'd know the fruit of following you fully, and that we as a church would put you first in all things. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Scene one is Palm Sunday. Matthew 21, starting in verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus, Jesus then sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and the crowds that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Have you ever planned a grand entrance? I'm talking about an Aladdin type of entrance. You guys remember Aladdin? <laughs> Strolling in to woo Princess Jasmine on an elephant and with a whole entourage of people. Maybe you planned a grand entrance for a birthday party or for a champion's banquet or maybe a retirement party. When I think of a grand entrance, an epic entrance, I can't help but think of an event from my wedding day. Seven years ago, I married my high school sweetheart, Carly. And in preparation for that big day, I really wanted to make sure to enter into our reception in a triumphal way because I felt victorious. For years, I'd been trying to get this girl to say I do, and she finally did. And I was excited. And so I wanted to celebrate. And so I decided to pull up to the wedding reception with Carly on the back of my Harley Davidson. And it was epic. The music was playing. Our friends and family members were there. It was one of the most exciting moments of my entire life. I was so moved that even though I was trying to keep it cool, Tears were coming down my face, and I'll never forget it. It was a triumphal entry. Well, Jesus' triumphal entry was far more epic than mine. According to verse 11, the whole city was stirred up when Jesus arrived. Not just a pocket of people, the entire city. Swelling crowds of people were laying down cloaks and palm branches on the road. They were singing. They were shouting. The city was bursting at the seams and everyone was buzzing about Jesus. And this just happened to be the same time that hundreds of thousands of outsiders were flooding into Jerusalem with Passover lambs to celebrate the Passover meal. Jesus is coming Hundreds of thousands of outsiders are coming and everyone is buzzing about Jesus. And although his entrance was epic, it raises a ton of questions. When you're reading the Bible, I hope you're asking questions. One of the most obvious questions in this text is why the donkey? If you were the king of creation, would you cruise up on a donkey? I doubt it. I would be on a lion, preferably, or... Something really ferocious? Why the donkey? Or why the palm branches and the cloaks in the road? What, what's that all about? Why the fickle crowds? How could the people go from crying Hosanna on Sunday to crying crucify him on Friday? How does this happen? Well, believe it or not, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem was a grand display of of power. Now a donkey may seem inferior to a Harley, and I believe it is, or it may seem inferior to an elephant or inferior to a noble steed, which other kings would typically ride. While it seems inferior, it actually made a greater statement than all of them. You see, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem was earth-shattering because it was in fulfillment of a 500-year-old prophecy. Zechariah 9, 9 says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Rejoice, righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The humble king, astride a donkey, was the promised king of peace. He was the hope of the nations. He was the promised savior of the entire world. And so when the people saw this prophecy unfolding in front of their very eyes, they couldn't help but go nuts. By laying palm branches and cloaks on the road, they were basically saying, you can walk on me. 
I'm your servant. You are my Lord. This scene had every sign and every symbol of a coronation, but sadly, it was a false coronation. We learn pretty quickly that the shouts for salvation were actually just empty words. Because the salvation that they were crying for was not the salvation that Jesus came to bring. See, the crowds, they wanted a sword-bearing king. Jesus came to be a cross-bearing servant. The crowds wanted salvation from the Romans. Jesus came to bring salvation from sin. And the moment Jesus failed to meet their expectations, they turned on him. Scene one is a picture of proclamation without practice. And it teaches us a very valuable lesson about fruitlessness. And it's this. Lesson number one about fruitlessness is that fruitless followers fear the crowd. They worship Jesus when he's popular, but reject him when he's not. They praise Jesus when life is good and life is easy, but they run from him when it's hard. And it's because they fear the crowd more than they fear the Lord. This scene takes me back to my time in high school. So I attended two local high schools here in the AV. I went to Desert Christian my freshman year, and then I went to Court Sill the remainder of my time in high school. And I loved both of those schools. Made great friends, awesome teachers, had a great time. But those two schools were very different when I was there. When I went to Desert Christian, believe it or not, following Jesus was actually a cool thing to do. At Desert Christian, I respected and admired the guys and gals who put their faith first and they would lead and they'd love and they'd serve. And I'm like, man, I want to be like that. And so I would follow Jesus because it was the cool thing to do. And I was the king of all the little Christianese things. I knew about the latest worship songs and I knew about purity rings and I watched what everyone else was watching in the Christian world. And I I was well informed with Christianese and I followed Jesus because Jesus was cool. Then I went to Quartz Hill. <laughs> I think you guys went to Quartz Hill too, sounds like. <laughs> Quartz Hill is awesome. Great people, great school, made great friends. But no one cared about Jesus. Very few people cared about Jesus that I knew. I'm sure there were people there who did, but I didn't know of them. And so I'm making new friends. I'm a Jesus freak, and they're not. And eventually, I begin to turn on my Savior. I follow the crowds. I care more about what people think of me than what God thinks of me. And so I begin to conform because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be liked. I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be loved by the people around me, and I turned my back on my Savior just to fit in with the crowd. To this day, it still breaks my heart that I would do something like that. But I did it. But here's the thing. I've learned over the years that I'm not the only one guilty of this. You know, American Christianity, if you think about American Christianity— It's pretty saturated with fickle followers. People who are in one day and then out the next. And there's no greater picture of this than what's going to happen next week. Next week is very exciting. It's Easter Sunday. And guess what's going to happen to this service? If you're late, you're going to be sitting in the overflow room. And if you come early, there'll probably be an overflow room for that too if you're late to the early service. This coming Sunday and Saturday night is going to be so exciting because thousands of people from our community are going to come and worship Jesus. But you know what's going to happen the following week? You know the faces I'm going to see? You guys again. And I'm not sick of you guys, but, <laughs> but I'm, just, I'm just saying. It's, it's, there's, there's this consumer mentality 
And we want guests to come and we love guests and I don't want to shame them. I'm not trying to shame you. I'm not trying to say I don't love you. I do love you. I'm just pointing out it's so easy to be fickle. It's so easy to make Christianity a Sunday thing or an Easter thing and a not, not an everyday life thing. Jesus, he wants so more and so much more from you and he has so much more to give you. If you're willing to let him invade your space every day, you're going to see living for Jesus during the week is the most exciting part about living for Jesus. Sundays are cool, but the week is where it happens. And so let me just ask you, is Jesus the king of your life? If Passion Week teaches us anything, it teaches us that with Jesus, it's all or nothing. He's Lord of all or not Lord at all. And so I would just want to encourage you. I'm not trying to guilt trip you. I just want to encourage you. Don't be guilty of a false coronation. Scene one is fruitless because it's a false coronation. Let's move now to scene two. Scene two is the fig tree. And it's in Matthew 21, verse 18. This is what it says. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, Jesus became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it, and he found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. So the next day, Jesus entered the city again, but this time it wasn't so exciting. No fanfare, no palm branches, no cloaks on the ground, no singing, no dancing. And upon entering, he did something very, very strange. He walked up to a beautiful tree that appeared to have fruit on it. And when he went to grab some fruit, he realized that it was barren. And so he cursed the tree and he left. Now, if you're new to the Bible, you're probably wondering, what in the world does Jesus have against trees? Well, nothing. Okay, he made trees. He loves trees. But there was something very wrong with this tree. What was wrong with this tree? It was a fraud. It lured in hungry travelers, then left them empty and dissatisfied. It was fruitless. It was a fraud. It was a fake. It gave false hope. It's like pulling up to Chick-fil-A on a Sunday. <laughs> you ever done that? I hope, you, I hope I'm not the only one. Okay, thank you. I, it, that is like the worst feeling ever. Great day at church, kids in the car, craving a chicken sandwich. Like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. Pull up to the place. No one's there. Every time that's happened to me, it's happened more than once, I cursed the place and I left, okay? <laughs> False hope is the worst. Last year, I hiked uh, Mount Whitney with a group of my friends. And it was an exciting journey. We completed the entire hike in a single day. 22 miles, 18 hours straight of hiking. I was awake for over 30 hours off, off of four hours of sleep to an elevation of 14,505 feet. It was, it was totally grueling, especially the um, summiting the mountain. But coming down the mountain was even harder than I anticipated. I knew that summiting would be hard because of the elevation and adjusting, but coming down, I really started to feel it in my body, in my knees. My, everything just started to, to break down. And so I asked my friend who was leading the way, kept asking, which I should have never done, I started asking, how much further? <laughs> and every time I asked how much further, he said four miles. And then I realized we just went four miles. How much further? Oh, four more miles. And then we'd go two miles. Hey, how much further? Oh, four more miles. And so then I'm like, you know what? You're either delirious or a terrible guide. I'm done. I'm done asking. And the reason I, I was getting frustrated is because you know when, when you want to finish something like a workout, to, you, you have an end in mind and to know that it's never ending, it can be frustrating. It's like false hope. It was this false hope. And, and he was a great guide and he's a great friend. But I just stopped asking because the false hope was too much to bear. 
The barren fig tree is an object lesson about fruitlessness and false hope. You see, in the Old Testament, the books of Jeremiah, Hosea, God called Israel his personal fig tree. And that might sound weird to us, but it was actually a very tender thing to do. God called his people his fig tree. In other places, he called his people his vineyard. And he pulled them out of slavery. He pulled them out of Egypt. He planted them in a new territory called Israel. He provided them with everything that they needed. He tended to their needs, cared for them, helped them grow. But over time, you know what happened? They became barren. They appeared to be healthy and strong, but their leaves, their green leaves, were just a disguise. And do you know what they used to disguise their fruit? They used religion. They used religion to disguise their fruit. They thought that if they tried hard enough, they could fabricate growth. And so they made religion their hope. Earning salvation their hope. You see, religion is about projecting perfection. Religion is about doing whatever it takes to look good on the outside and to make God love you and make God bless you, even though in your heart you don't actually love him or the people around you. And the problem with religion is that religion breeds false hope. There's an appearance of salvation, but no fruit. Jesus reserved his harshest words for religious people. People who were rejecting him as the Savior, who came to do it all for them and were trying on their own to rise above the rest and be unlike anyone else with a holier-than-thou attitude when deep down they were full of wickedness. Listen to what Jesus says to the religious people on Tuesday of Passion Week. The next day after cursing the tree, he says this to the religious leaders. This is just a warning for us who are religious. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way on the outside, you appear to be people as righteous but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and full of wickedness. Those are strong words. Scene two teaches us a second lesson about fruitlessness. And it's this. Fruitless followers fabricate growth. Fruitless followers fabricate growth. There's a dirty word in the Bible for religious phonies. It's the word hypocrite. In the Greek, the word hypocrite actually means play actor. A hypocrite was somebody who would put a mask on and put on a play to entertain people. It was actually kind of a cool thing. And it's totally fine to see a hypocrite on a big screen or to see a hypocrite on stage with a mask. But if your life is a life of hypocrisy, then that's just deceitful. And believe it or not, and I'm not trying to come down hard. I'm just trying to show everybody our own struggle with these things that Jesus was confronting during Passion Week. Believe it or not, we are all tempted to become actors. And in reality, acting has never been easier than in this digital age. I could have a miserable day and post a picture of me smiling with my kids and everyone thinks I'm the happiest guy on earth. Social media has turned us into masters of disguise. We can project to the world whatever we want and hide whatever we despise. We can live our entire lives behind a mask. But here's the problem. Pretending to be perfect will never make you happy. 
If you're here today and you feel a weight on your shoulders to put out this vibe that you have it all together all the time and you're wearing a mask pretending to be perfect, I want you to know you could take it off. And if we have ever created an environment here where you feel like you have to put a mask on to go to church, I apologize with my entire heart. Because I know that faking it is the worst thing that we can do for our souls. Because when we fake it, we reject what Jesus has and we try to create our own road that will somehow produce happiness in our own hearts. But it's a dead end. And when we lie in bed at night, we know No one really knows us. I hope you know that Jesus is happy for you to take off the mask. You know what he would have loved to see from the religious leaders? For them, instead of standing up in front of everyone and pretending that they had it together, he would have loved for them to say, I don't have it together. Actually, I don't have it together so much that Jesus, I need you. They couldn't do it. They had an image to maintain. Wearing a mask will never make you happy. Pretending to be perfect will never make you happy. But you know what can make you happy? Jesus says this in Matthew, Matthew 5, 3. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know what Jesus says? The happy people, it's the Greek word makarios, the happy people are the people who know they don't have it all together. He says that they're poor in spirit. That means they know they're spiritually bankrupt. And so they're not pretending to be something that they're not. They're saying, I don't have it all together. There are some major holes in my life that, and, but praise God, I've got a savior. Can I get an Amen. Praise God we have a Savior. Take off the mask. Take off the mask. Create a culture that allows people to take off the mask. Because as long as we make religion all about projecting perfection, we will miss it. We will fabricate fruit and therefore be fruitless. Scene number two is fruitless because we can't fake fruit. The last tree of Passion Week is the cross. The difference between this tree and the others is that while the first two appeared to be fruitful, but were actually barren, this one appears to be barren, but proves to bear fruit for all eternity. The story of the cross starts in Matthew 26, passage Pastor Matt just read. In Matthew 26, Jesus is enjoying the Passover meal on Thursday evening with his disciples, his close friends. After the meal, they retire for the evening in a garden close by called Gethsemane. And as they slept, Jesus sat awake. But he sat awake in agony. He knew what was just around the corner. And as he thought about what the Father was requiring of him and what he was coming to do, he began to sweat drops of blood. A rare medical condition that only happens under the most tremendous pressure a person can feel. Just then, as he's wrestling with God and resolves in his heart to pursue the cross before him, Just then, his friend, Judas, walked up with a band of soldiers. He betrayed the Lord with a kiss, and he handed him over to Roman and Jewish officials. Alone and abandoned, Jesus underwent a series of false and illegal trials held in the middle of the night. He was mocked, he was spit upon, he was beaten, he was flogged. Flogging, just so you know, was a legal preliminary to every Roman execution. They would take the convicted criminal, they'd strip him of his clothing, and tie his hands to an upright post. After this, a Roman soldier would grab what's called a cat of nine tails, which was a short leather whip made of braided leather straps of different lengths. And on these straps were 
uh, small iron balls and sharp pieces of broken sheep bone. And then this whip was used to beat the back, buttocks, and legs of the victim. Soldiers taking turns with each strike until the victim was just short of death. Forty lashes minus one. We read in Matthew that after this, Jesus was then paraded around as a false king, another false coronation. The purple robe draped across his bloodied body and a crown of thorns forced upon his skull. And finally, he was sent to be crucified. Crucifixion, just so you know, is one of mankind's most brutal inventions. The goal of crucifixion was to kill someone as slowly and painfully as as possible. The pain was so horrendous that a word was invented to describe it. The word excruciating literally means from the cross. Most Roman citizens despised crucifixion. They wouldn't even talk about it. It was too disgraceful, but Jews especially hated it. The historian Josephus, a Jewish historian, said it was the most wretched of deaths. And Deuteronomy 21 says that anyone hanged on a tree is cursed by God. Well, Jesus was then forced to carry this tree, a rugged cross, to the place of his execution, a place called Gol- Golgotha, which means a place of the skull. And although Jesus was young and healthy, he worked as a carpenter. He was in good shape, it, it seems. Although he was young and healthy, He was unable to carry his cross. He was too wounded to do it alone. And so a man from the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, was forced to help. Jesus was then laid across the rugged beams and nailed to the wood with five to seven inch metal spikes through his hands and feet, the most sensitive nerve endings in the entire body. The cross was then hoisted up, dropped into a hole, where the victim was left to die a slow and agonizing death for all to see, death by asphyxiation. Death on the cross happened because of suffocation. As the victim hung, the lungs would collapse, and the only way to get a breath was to pull on the nails and push with your feet until you could no longer do it. Right there, bloodied, marred, And lifted up for all to see, Jesus Christ breathed his last breath. At this point in the story of Passion Week, you can't help but ask the question, why? Why did Palm Sunday turn into a crucifixion on Friday? Why did Jesus ever allow this to happen? How did the praises of Hosanna turn into cries for crucifixion? How is the Lord, the King of all, lifted up on a cross, treated like a criminal? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus ordained it. Jesus came to Jerusalem that Sunday with one purpose. He knew the moment the world saw him as the king that they would turn on him and it would lead him to the cross. And the reason he went to the cross joyfully and with resolve was because of you. He loves you. He knew that false religion could never save. We need a savior. He knew that living behind a mask could never make us happy. We need somebody who accepts us where we are and changes us from the inside out. He knew that we could never atone for our guilt, for our sin, for our shame. We need somebody to take that punishment on their shoulders for us. And so Jesus went to the cross gladly for you and for me. He went to the cross gladly for the mockers, for the crowds who turned their backs, for the religious hypocrites. He went for all of them. And with arms wide open, he said, come to me and I'll give you life. Listen to 1 Peter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have 
been healed. Jesus came to be the savior of the world. And an instrument of death is now a symbol of hope because through that one action, many are made righteous. True righteousness. The righteousness of God. Not a righteousness that we could fabricate, not a righteousness that we could pretend to, to make in our lives, but a true righteousness where we look to our Savior, we put our faith in him. He washes as white as, as snow because he died on that cross for every single sin. He gives us his righteousness and a new life, and therefore that tree bears fruit for all eternity. Can I get an amen? amen. The most barren tree of all is the one that continues to bear fruit today. Have you experienced the fruit of Calvary? Maybe you were like the crowds. In one day, out the next. Well, Jesus went to the cross even for the crowds. Fear the Lord. Come to him and watch what he'll do in your life. Maybe you're like the hypocrites living behind the mask. Well, Jesus says, come to me. And instead of trying to make it on your own, I'll give you rest. That verse is in context to hypocrisy. People who are trying to earn their way in the kingdom, Jesus says, I already did it for you. Are you fruitful? Are you actually happy in your heart because of the peace of Christ ruling your, your life or are you pretending happiness? Do you really love the Lord and are you bearing fruit or are you proclaiming something and practicing something else? I encourage you today, be fruitful. Jesus went to the cross so that you can bear fruit. Come to him and experience his grace. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you so much for going to the cross for us. I know that there are scenes in our lives where we uh, appear to be fruitful, but we're really not. And I pray that we'd be able to take off the mask, that we would stop following the crowds, and that we would come to you in private as we really are and experience your forgiveness, your new life. I pray that your fruit in us would produce fruit in others. And I pray that this place would be a safe place where sinners can be real about what they're really going through and we can know firsthand the joy of your salvation. Bless this day and bless next Easter as we celebrate the fact that you are not in a tomb, but you are alive. In Jesus' name, amen.